So I'm going to talk about uh, super nuclear, pretty clear, and nuclear our common leaders. And basically, it just means above, below, and between the nuclear. So if you just have that basic definition in mind, it'll help you avoid the number one error. And the number one error is assuming that all double vision is from nerve. And that's what my residents do. When they come out of the room, they always want to jump straight to six nerve palsy, third nerve palsy, etc. So if you just think about, could it be supernuclear, could it be infranuclear, or could it be intranuclear, every time on every diplomia patient, you will start to reinforce and remind the anatomic pathways we're going to cover. And then you can go back and make the diagnosis of nerve. And there are ways clinically to differentiate supernuclear from infranuclear palsies. And that's by driving the system normally with the vestibular ocular reflex, which is the dull set maneuver, and convergence for the horizontal uh, problems that Mike already alluded to, the INO, the uh, one and a half syndrome. Sometimes we can get the eyes to converge, and that shows you that the muscle and the junction, everything below the nucleus, can, can fire. It's just the supernuclear or internuclear connections that are bad. And I'll show you some quick examples. So, supernuclear gaze palsy can be vertical or horizontal. And one of the key things clinically is can we make it the eyes move? And if you can make the eyes move with the doll's head maneuver, as you know, a, a doll's head, doll's eyes are not animate, so when you rotate the eyes, they passively move. If you can do that, then you know that the system can fire, that the muscle is fine and the junction is fine. And if you can establish that the eyes can move, then you've already made the, the point that it is supernuclear, at least partially supernuclear. The same thing for convergence. If we can get someone to look at a mirror target and the eyes can cross in, then you know whatever is keeping the eyes from moving inward uh, can be overcome with another stimulus, in this case, convergence. So what we mean by supernuclear, infranuclear, and intranuclear is simply what is the relationship of the anatomic pathway that's been damaged relative to the nucleus. So if it's above the nucleus, supernuclear. If it's below the nucleus, infranuclear. And infranuclear is just our fancy way of saying the nerve, the muscle, and the junction. And then the two, the, the nuclei talk to each other. And the one we're going to talk about is internuclear optomaglegia, I know. And those often are motor nuclei all over the brain. So that's the way oversimplified view. But that's how I and most ophthalmologists think about these things. I'm sure Jason is cringing in his seats because uh, neurologists don't learn about this a supernuclear and infranuclear pathway the same way ophthalmologists do. We look at it at, from a morphologic standpoint. What do we see in the clinic and can we make it match the anatomy? And yes, are we going to order a scan? Yes, no. And uh, so that's why it's a little more simplistic. So my apologies in advance to Jason. So here's the pathways, and we're not going to go over this too much except to emphasize to you that the ocular motor nuclei live in the brainstem, three, four, six. I don't know if we still have that pointer. Could you take it with your Good. Um, so three, four, and six live in the, the midbrain and the pons. And then anything above these nuclei is what we call supernuclear, and anything between the nuclei is what we call internuclear. So the nuclei, in this case, the example is given right out of Deuce's nucleus, has to talk to the muscles. This is the infranuclear pathway. This is the nuclear pathway, and everything above this is the supernuclear pathway. And anything between the two nuclei talking, in this case, the sixth nerve nucleus talking to the left ocular motor nucleus, is the internuclear pathway. So we want to make our eyes go that way. The lateral rectus has to fire. The nucleus has to fire for the abducens. And if it's communicating with the contralateral ocular motor nucleus to fire the contralateral medial rectus muscle, and that injured neuron is called the medial longitudinal facility. So this same th thing occurs for vertical as for horizontal. So for a vertical gaze, the vertical gaze center lives up here. It's got all sorts of components to it which you don't need to know, but I'll just mention them for completeness. The rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus and the interstitial nucleus of Caha, as well as the area of dark darkness, at least in the cock. And you heard some of those names from Jason and from Mike already. The names are not important. What's important to know is the supranuclear components live above the nuclear components, 
And that supranuclear vertical gaze center lives between the, the left thalamus and the midbrain. And so when you have rostral midbrain abnormalities at the collateral lucids of valley junction, you can get vertical gaze problems. And the connections between that vertical gaze center and the nuclei can produce inability to move your eyes for vertical gaze. And up gaze is a little bit different than down gaze because the vertical gaze a pathway for up gaze crosses in this posterior commissure, and that means a single lesion at the level of the posterior commissure can cause an up gaze paresis. And that's why, for the paranoid dorsal midbrain syndrome, up gaze paresis is way more common than down gaze paresis because when it's pressing on this PC, the posterior commissure here, from let's say hydrocephalus in this location or a pineal tumor, the first thing it's going to dig out is that up gaze paresis. It's the up gaze tumor. So for up gaze, and we don't have time to talk about saccades versus pursuit, but just to demonstrate diagrammatically, the right frontal eye field is talking, in this case, to move the eyes to the left, to the final common pathway, the left abducens nucleus, which is talking via the interneuron, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, to the contralateral third nerve nucleus, to make the eyes go the opposite direction. So, this complicated diagram, you can either memorize all of these things or you can just think about it very simplistically, which is the way I think, and I think Peter mentioned to you that's the way he thinks too. It's, I'm glad we shared that. Nuclei, three, four, six, live in midbrain and pons. Final common pathway is nucleus. The two nuclei have to talk to each other, six and three, via medial longitudinal fasciculus. The nuclei have to be told what to do by supranuclear input. That supranuclear input comes from your brain, frontal eye fields and broad occipital temporal lobe. In the midbrain, in the rostral midbrain, at the thalamomesencephalic junction, is the vertical gaze center. And in the pons, the horizontal gaze center. So if you just know those compartments, you kind of can clinically figure out whether we're dealing with a supranuclear problem, an internuclear problem, or a nuclear problem. So here's this patient. She looks down. Okay, so pretty good. When she tries to look up, she can't look up. So how do we know if this is just your, your old age patient can't look up, or is this supranuclear up gaze paresis? So one of the things we can do is the dolls and maneuver to try and make the eyes go up. And in that patient, there was a glamorous battle. I think she had a stroke. Here's another patient who can't look up. And we can doll's head the eyes up. So when we passively rotate the head, the eyes go up. So she can't voluntarily initiate her up gaze movement. And that can be dissociated for cigars or pursuits. So you have to test them separately. But in this case, we know that the eyes can go up. So it's not restricted. It's not muscle. The eyes can move up. It's just a supranuclear vertical gaze palsy. And many of my patients who have this supranuclear gaze palsy at the level of the vertical gaze center have vision traction. And it, it kind of looks like thyroid vision traction, but it, it's a little bit different and usually they don't have this lag in that gaze. So it's like a primary position of And here's another example of a patient who cannot look up and in an attempted up gaze, they get a substituted movement, a convergence and a retraction. And that is called convergence retraction. By status, it's not really an aesthetics, it's just co-firing of those muscles, and then that's another sign of the paranoid source of midbrain So what happens is, when they try to look up, and it's usually worse for saccades, so sometimes I'll use an okay and drum rolling downward to try and induce an upward saccade, they get this jerky convergence and then retraction movement, and sometimes it's better seen from looking at the sides. And what you're going to be looking for is other sides of the dorsal midbrain, involvement of the etic and west column nucleus with light hair association of the pupils, that lid retraction in primary position, which we call coliaris, lid retraction sign, and then the defective vertical gaze, and as I mentioned, up gaze is usually affected first, because single lesion in the posterior commissure can produce the up gaze paresis. And the important thing is that it localizes to the dorsal midbrain, a whole long list of causes. So this patient that had that up gaze paresis that can be overcome with the doll's head maneuver and the lid retraction from the coliar side, there is a lesion just at the level you'd expect in the dorsal midbrain. I think this was a hemorrhage. The other thing that I have seen a lot of, and perhaps you have seen too, is
have undergone cardiac surgery, sometimes will wake up and they can't move their eyes. And this is new in, uh, as a, an acquired or supernuclear ocular motor paresis. They sometimes have the globally, but usually not. They usually have this mild bilateral partial ptosis, and they just cannot look up. Sometimes the patients have an associated internuclear ophthalmoplegia or horizontal gaze paresis or some combination of it. Their saccades tend to be quite slow. Their pursuit is usually better. And I don't, I've given these patients up and down and I've never found a cause. No structural lesion is identified. I don't know if my colleagues have found things. But some patients with that exact same syndrome have a lesion. Uh, it can be hemorrhage or infarct. This, you can see, is a dark on T2. See the lesion here, right at the lateral pieces of valley junction. So it's the lesions that cause these supranuclear upgaze problems are the posterior commissure or the connection point between the vertical gaze center and the nuclei. So anything in this region here. For horizontal gaze, it's in the pons. And the final common pathway, of course, is the sixth nerve nucleus and its adjacent parapontine reticular formation. You don't need to know that, but what you need to know is horizontal gaze, pons, vertical gaze, midbrain, and the lateral distance of valve junction. So when it's a horizontal problem, we're really looking more caudally in the pons. So here's a patient who has a horizontal gaze palsy. You can see that they can't look that way. It's a primary position. <laughs> can't look that way, but a little bit of adduction. And one of the things that I've already told you is patients sometimes have more than one problem. So they can have a horizontal gaze palsy and an INO on the same side. Or they can have bilateral horizontal gaze palsy and an INO. So the, the processes are not mutually exclusive. And you can see the large lesion in the dorsal pons accounting for this. So when you have horizontal gaze palsies, one and a half syndromes, and if you're nuclear complegias, that's pons. And one of the things that can show you that the, the infranuclear pathway is intact is you can make these eyes move, in this case, with convergence. So the convergence near effort shows you that the medial rectus muscle and the junction can fire. It's the supranuclear and internuclear input to these nu nuclei that is preventing the eyes from moving. And so convergence effort here overcomes the deviation, which means the infranuclear pathway is intact. And Michael, I'm going to show you an INO, nuclear optometry. This is just a cartoon representation of an INO. The INO, in this case, the adduction deficit, attempting to look this direction, and then also the associated horizontal abducting nystagmus in the contralateral eye. In a young patient, that's usually multiple sclerosis. In an old patient, it's usually in part, but any structural lesion of the medial longitude of the sigillus will produce this fine. And so in the books, the book ones always look like this. They can't abduct at all, and then they develop this large abducting horizontal dissociated contralateral gaze nystagmus. But this INO thing is very subtle sometimes. And in the, most of my patients who have unilateral INOs that are obvious actually have bilateral INOs when it's the abominating disease if you test them carefully. In this case, the patient also has an INO on this side. Same thing, can't look this way, abducting nystagmus, adduction. So we know that this is dorsal, bilateral, and pons. This is a one and a half syndrome. So the patient has the horizontal gaze palsy plus INO. So one gaze palsy, half the INO. And you can get bilateral horizontal gaze palsy. You can get bilateral intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. You can get bilateral intranuclear ophthalmoplegia with the eyes being slightly exotropic, which we call wall-eye bilateral intranuclear ophthalmoplegia or lino. You can get that wall-eye thing, which is a unilateral intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, which we call the minor, wall-eye monocular intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. I don't think those things are important to know. What's important to know is if you've got a problem with horizontal gaze, you should be thinking about ponds. And normally, if they don't have any other findings, you're going to be thinking about uh, dorsal ponds. Um, many of the, the things that we have seen are uh, 
in the periaqueductal gray region. And I just showed this slide to show you that you, it's sometimes hard on imaging to see this because the CSF signal is sometimes very bright here. And I'm going to show you in the MRI talk some techniques that will allow us to see this area a little bit better. But that's where you should be concentrating your effort, both in the membrane and the pause is dorsal. And the other reason for showing that slide was to show you that the anatomic drawing is upside down relative to the imaging. So whenever we show the anatomic drop, drawing, the thing that's at the top of the slide is actually at the back of the imaging study. So the area of interest is back here. So dorsal pods and dorsal midbrain are the two areas that you're going to be looking at for these types of interneuron problems and horizontal and vertical case problems. So you kind of have to turn the imaging study on its head. This is reversed here at the eyeballs. So that when you're thinking about the anatomic images, you can put in your brain that the Radiograph is actually upside down. I want to end with this skew deviation. Skew deviation for me means you have some type of vertical ocular misalignment and it can mimic anything, but it basically can be confused with things that look like oblique muscle paresis or it doesn't actually match specifically to a single muscle or a single cranial nerve distribution. And Anytime you get to the bottom of a chart and say impression, this motility doesn't add up, or the three-step test doesn't match the four-term policy, you should be thinking about two things, skew and myasthenia graphs. In my experience, myasthenia is more, more common, but skew, and then especially in any patient that has a very posterior process size. So it's defining features on versus vertical deviation, a hypertrophia, it's often commented, and they may or may not have the full blown ocular tilt reaction, which will produce the head tilt. And the key and differentiating feature is there's torsion in both eyes. So as opposed to the fourth nerve palsy, where you have only the torsion in the one eye, in the, the tilt reaction, the hypertrophia and the tilt can match or mimic fourth nerve palsy, but the torsion will be in both eyes typically towards the hypertrophic eye. So both the torsion and the hip tilt tilt towards the hypertrophic eye. So some authors have recommended that the three-step test be augmented by doing the torsion test. So you want to do the normal three-step test, hypertropia, right and left gaze, right and left head tilt, but you want to look at the torsion. And if the torsion doesn't match, I'm going to write probable skew at the bottom. So it's kind of a vertical deviation that kind of doesn't match. Most of my questions with skew do not have this dramatic vertical deviation. And it's basically thought to be a mismatch of signal from the otolith system and the vestibular ocular system. So normally, as you know, when you tilt your head, the world does not tilt with you. So if you tilt, the world stays straight up and down because there is counter rolling to keep the world alive. And so that's a real important thing, especially if you're trying to ride a motorcycle. Because you'd crash if you didn't have this counter rolling. So when that counter rolling mechanism goes astray, you'll get skew and you'll get a tilt, the ocular tilt reaction, because your brain thinks that the world is tilted and so your head will, will tilt. So they'll come in with the head tilt, the hyperdeviation, and the, the important differentiating feature is torsion. You can measure the torsion, and there are all sorts of nomograms that have been devised. I kind of just like to look at the fovea and see if it's at the lower third of the dismargin. If the fovea is pointing up here, then I know there's torsion, and then you can kind of make a little prediction about how much torsion you see by measuring against the fundus tilt. So I take a 60 degree photograph of the fundus when I'm trying to do this torsion uh, measurement objectively. Subjectively, you can measure the torsion as you know with the double max. So this skew deviation is the pre-nuclear pathway interruption from the input from the vestibular system, and that input is going to those vertical uh, ocular motor nuclei in the brainstem. There have been reports of cerebellar lesions of living causing skew, but in general, it's thought to be this mechanism, the vestibular odor So when should you think about skew deviation? You should think about skew deviation if you do the three-step test and you don't get the fourth nerve. Gunder von Neumann used to tell me, if you do the three-step test and you don't get superior belief, you did it wrong, or they have skew, or myasthenia, or some other diagnosis, thyroid you should think about skew if you diagnose impression isolated in fear of the muscle palsy. That's super rare. It does occur. I think I've probably seen it twice. I don't know Mike, how many of these you've seen in fear of lean palsy? Yeah. Two. So that's kind of the role number two. And uh, you should be thinking about skew. And then the important thing, the fourth step in the three-step test, measure the torsion. And if the torsion doesn't match, 
and you've got a bilateral torsion towards the hypertrophic guide, that's much more likely to be skewed with an optimum tilt reaction than a fourth grade palsy with a funny torsion. And as I mentioned, you can measure that either objectively by looking at the fundus or subjectively with the double maddox rod. You know, you've got the two rods here, the red and the white. You, you line up the lightness, help the patient. Are they parallel like railroad tracks or is one tilted? And they put their hand on the little dial and they turn the dial until they become parallel. And then you measure directly off the instrument. The thing that's hardest for me is these lenses don't come with a little line, so we actually have to etch in a little line onto the, the, the a little lens. So I know that that's 90 degrees. And as I said before, you can see the torsion. And so the fundus normally is down here at the lower one third of the disc, and when it's way up there, you know that that's torsion. And so when I see bilateral torsion, when I measure bilateral torsion, that's the person I'm thinking has either bilateral disease or skew. And when the torsion doesn't match, I think skew. And it can be from any brain stem lesion. You can imagine that low lip disruption is not a very localized description. Uh, and I've seen it from anything. Midbrain, ponds, or medulla, all lesions in this location. And as I mentioned before, I just want to show that cerebral lesions can produce this as well. So in summary, the, the supra, infra, and intranuclear pathway for regular ophthalmologists like me is above, below, and between. I differentiate them by using the dog's head maneuver, and for horizontal gaze, we can overcome it sometimes with the convergence effort. That convergence effort sometimes helps separate rostral lesions from caudal lesions because the convergence effort implies that the near reaction, which is more rostral, uh, is intact. I showed you some examples of vertical and horizontal gaze palsies, but what really you should be taking home is vertical, that's the rostral, midbrain, collateral lesions of cephalic junction, and up gaze more common because of posterior commissure. Horizontal gaze palsies, that's pons, any combination of I and O, horizontal gaze palsy, one and a half center, or whatever you want to make. And you should be thinking about skew deviation when it doesn't add up, when the torsion doesn't match, or if the three-step test doesn't localize. And I thank you for your time.